We have 106 registered, so uh, excellent. Um, we're going to blow up Zoom with these things for sure. So this uh, session today, webinar will focus on the basics of home canning, safety first. Uh, this is, let's see, my second of second webinar so far. I did one last weekend, freezing, and I'll do. Uh, there's six more coming up for this summer and fall. Uh, you can find if you don't know the. I'll show you the reference later and where you can register and find out for the other ones. And we we are recording those, so if you know people that couldn't attend today or you wanted to um, re-listen to something that I said, uh, we'll get that link out to you. And we have a YouTube channel, we'll be sharing that. Um, just to let you know that um, I, we may go over our hours. So if you can hang on, fine. If you can, I understand. Again, as I said, this will be recorded and you can um, you know, jump on later and listen to what you might have missed. So here's me in my garden. My name is Suzanne Dreesen. Welcome, everyone. I'm an extension educator specializing in food safety. I've been with the University of Minnesota Extension uh, for 23 years, and I'm an avid food preserver. I started preserving food when I was probably eight years old, maybe younger. I grew up on a farm in southwest Minnesota near Canby. And um, I had, you know, we had a big family. There was 13, uh, 13 mouths to feed. And so we had a huge garden and raised chicken and livestock. And we did a lot of food preservation. We did a lot of canning, freezing. And sometimes I felt like I was on a food, small food processing um, farm or factory when we were, we were doing our, our canning. But what was nice about that is, and if you've done some preserving yourself, it does take a team effort. And if you can have a little processing line, um, things go better and faster. So, um, and then you're preserving, you know, your quality and nutrients as well. So today I have a garden and I uh, live in St. Cloud in town. And I just have a small few garden beds um, that I have and I have, um, Let's see what I've froze so far. A lot of herbs, like dried herbs. Um, I'm doing a drying session. Um, we'll talk about herbs then. And then I also just on Saturday canned some dilly beans. I have I had some yellow uh, beans that I made, turned into dilly beans. Those are one of my favorites. So today we're going to. Um, my goal for these sessions really are to provide you with the procedures and science and really guide you through the process to preserve food safely, but not, but not only for safety, but for quality too, so that you can preserve it and enjoy that taste of summer all, all year long. So we'll look at how does canning preserve food, uh, when to use which canning method and what those canning methods are and what foods have to be preserved using what, which canning method. We'll look at a variety of resources for safe recipes and methods. And unfortunately, I won't be able to go through every fruit food product today. But um, if you have specific questions, um, you know, let me know. Put them in the chat, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And um, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on canning equipment, um, what's in and what's out. And we'll also look at some unsafe canning methods as well. And then food safety is really critical when you're canning. So we're going to look at some of those critical steps um, so that it's done safely and no one gets sick. And then we'll take a step-by-step -step, uh, overview of the boiling water canning process and then a step-by-step -step, um, procedure for preserving by using a pressure canner. So let's start with some canning basics. Um, canning is probably one of the most time um, and labor intensive preservation method that we have. Uh, but however, it's a great way to turn those foods into uh, something for your pantry and something that you can add to your menu when you're doing your menu planning. So how canning preserves food is it really is about that heat processing that happens either in the boiling water canner or the pressure canner. So when you put your uh, food in the jar, 
you put your lid on, your cap, and then you put it in, you further process it. And um, to high temperatures, that will destroy those disease-causing, illness-causing microorganisms, and then also those spoilage microorganisms, like your yeast molds that can spoil your food. And then another thing that happens during that heating process is it'll be, um, it'll inactivate enzymes that are responsible for those undesirable flavors and texture changes. But those enzymes help um, ripen our food and mature our fruits and vegetables. But that ripening process continues as um, we har after we harvest those. So we've got to stop that so it doesn't get soft, mushy, and yucky tasting. And then during that heating process, the air is driven out of the jar. It's a one-way valve. Things can get out, but things can't get in. As the jar later cools, then it will for form that nice tight vacuum seal. And then that airtight seal protects the food inside from further contamination and makes the food um, safe to store at room temperatures. So Clostridium botulinum is the bacteria that's responsible for producing botulism toxin. And it only thrives in low acid, oxygen-free environments and, that, and in moist foods as well, environments. So when you're canning low acid foods, like meat, poultry, fish, we'll talk more about those foods, um, these bacteria can thrive in any foods that have an acidity level of 4.6 or um, in that airtight environment, the end that airtight environment that we produce in a canning. Um, and then most again, our fruits and vegetables are canned either in liquid, so, and they also have a lot of moisture in them in itself. So what, when we do can low acid foods, what we do is we heat those in a pressure canner to 240 to 250 degrees. So that's a super heat that will destroy that clostridium botulinum spore so botulism can't grow. And know that that Clostridium botulinum spore does not germin germinate in high acid foods like our tomatoes or, or our um, peaches, salsas, things that we add acid to. Um, Clostridium botulinum can't germinate in the uh, pH above 4.6 or below 4.6, so we can safely can those in a water bath canner. So let's just look at um, some low acid foods that do require pressure canning. Again, those foods that will have a pH of 4.6, um, we have to pressure can in a pressure canner to eliminate that botul that spore that causes botulism. So those foods include asparagus, all vegetables mainly, um, like asparagus, carrots, peas, corn, pumpkin. And then also um, green beans, but any of your dried beans, um, if you're making a chili, that's gonna need to be pressure canned, as well as meats, poultry, fish, beans, soups. And then when you're adding, doing any combination foods like meat sauces, uh, those will need to be pressure canned also. Now your recipe will specify which process is safe for that product you are canning. So it'll say boiling water or um, pressure canner. Some acid foods, like um, apples and peaches, they'll give you instructions for both boiling water and pressure canner, so you can decide. Um, that's for acid foods, but low acid foods um, will only provide you instructions for pressure canner use. So boiling water is acceptable for high acid foods. And again, that clostridium botulinum spore won't grow in high acid foods. But why we further process it in, in hot water and boiling water is that we want to get rid of any of those spoilage microorganisms, uh, deactivate those um, mold and yeast spores, and then also um, any heat sensitive bacteria like salmonella, for example. So naturally at high acid foods like apples and foods with um, added acid like salsa or pickles, they'll have a pH of 4.6 or below and can be, that's the city view level, and can be safely home canned using that boiling water process. And then other foods that are, can be safely canned in uh, are high acid and can be safely canned in a boiling water canner 
Um, again, most fruits, fruit jam or jelly, fruit pie fillings, pickled vegetables and cucumbers, relishes, salsa, tomatoes, and fermented foods like sauerkraut. Uh, just to note that um, I know there's a few people that are doing some pickling that some recipes for pickling will um, use the boiling water canner, but the recipe says that you can uh, process those at, instead of two, uh, 212 at boiling at 180 degrees for a longer period of time. And that's to help maintain that um, crunchy uh, pickle for quality. And then whether you're using the pressure canning method or water bath canning method, um, altitude is a food safety consideration when canning. Most canning recipes are developed between zero and a thousand feet, uh, and it's fine to use the processing times and methods for zero to 2,000 feet if your location falls within these parameters for altitude, but for altitudes above a thousand feet, you have to add more time um, for boiling water canning or you increase the amount of pressure if you're pressure canning. And the reason for this is that water boils one degree lower for every 550 feet above sea level. So like where I live in, um, in Minnesota, our mean elevation is 1,200 feet. In St. Cloud, where I live, we're at 1,030 feet. So I need to choose pressure canning processing, our, our processing times for either water bath or pressure canning for um, 1,001 to 2,000 feet. Now, in some canning books, the, the um, altitude adjustments will be at the beginning of the book and not in each recipe. So just remember, it's usually, you will usually add five minutes for, um, for our Minnesota altitudes, or you're going to add five pounds of pressure, or we're going we're gonna to pressure can at 15 pounds um, in Minnesota. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Any recipes on our University of Minnesota Extension website have been adjusted for that Minnesota altitudes. So again, prevent botulism by making those um, altitude adjustments. So if you would please in the chat, um, what is your favorite resource for canning recipes and methods? Where do you get your canning information or advice? You want to pick out a few, Lisa? Yeah, recipe books. Um, the Ball Blue Book, which I know you mentioned uh, in your presentations. Um, someone said their mom. They would like another resource. Uh, the U of M, yay. Uh, a couple more for the, the Ball Canning Cookbook. My grandma and my mom. Uh, old thrift store books and the internet. Mainly recipes from my grandma. A lot of family recipes, old cookbooks, things like that are being mentioned. All right, good. Thank you, Lisa. And thanks everyone for sharing. Appreciate that. And I expected all those responses, so that's excellent. So um, and you mentioned um, family and friends and old cookbooks. Um, and somebody probably told you you could do something. <laughs> I, and uh, people in my, just my little family and friend circle have been doing a lot of uh, food preservation. And many times they'll say, you did what? <laughs> because, well, you know. So anyway, that's why we're here today. But according to the National Center for Home Food Preservation, 51% of home food preservers rely on family and friends for recipes and information. So grandma may be sharing what she learned from her mother, which is now out, outdated. And again, there's lots, um, many of you said you've got a lot, you um, look for the internet and that's our, you know, first instinct, let's search for it, right? Uh, there are lots of scary and unsafe methods though on the internet. So just because it's in print <laughs> doesn't mean it's safe. And using uh, credible and reliable food preservation recipes is critical so no one gets sick. And, and it'll also limit our you know, eliminate any food safety worries you have. If you're doing exactly by a credible research tested recipe, you're golden. You're going to be safe. <laughs> uh, you can also, if you, if you are using, you know, you have that favorite re um, pickle recipe 
or a recipe from that's passed on through the generation, those heirloom recipes. Uh, you can always verify that with a tested recipe to see if the processing times are the same, to see if the um, ingredients are about the same. And otherwise you can call our answer line and verify the safety of those family recipes, our internet searches. You can directly call um, our, and talk to an extension profess, a professional. Uh, it's staffed by our uh, Iowa State household professionals and they'll answer your questions about food safety, canning, any other food preservation method, and any other household um, things that you've got going on. Um, if you get water damage, those kind of things, they can walk you through that. It, um, Minnesota has, a, this is our, if you live in Minnesota, you, this is the number you use. Um, it's also a service that um, South Dakota and Iowa subscribe to and they have different different numbers as well. So the information there is there, of course it's on Monday through Friday and you're never doing canning um, during the day, right? But you can always leave messages for them if you call with outside of the business hours and then you can email your question as well too. They do have a, on their website that I have on the screen, they do have um, frequently asked questions, just click on food preservation and then they also have from there um, on their website, you can subscribe to their blog, which um, has a lot of timely and seasonal updates. It's a really great blog that the post will come into your email. Other, uh, some of you mentioned that you're looking for other resources and this is um, where we'll talk about those. And again, to prevent botulism and any food safety worries and to produce the best tastiest product out there, use those shared um, tested resources. So here's how what happens, you know, like, well, how do they get developed? Well, researchers actually will repeat um, the entire recipe preparation and canning process many times to get accurate data. So what they do is they put microorganisms into the jar and they make sure the processing time is sufficient to destroy those microorganisms. So again, to eliminate your food safety worries, um, tested resources are, include anything from the USDA, the safe um, or the complete guide to home canning that's available um, for download three. And the National Center for Home Food Preservation um, is out of the University of Georgia. And they do the, uh, canning and food preservation research for USDA. And they also produce this So Easy to Preserve, that book that you'll see in your screen. I think it's um, $20, but it's got all of the food preservation methods in it. It's a great resource in the publication. I love it. But on their website, I'll show you in a minute, they have all kinds of um, free resources and recipes. So excellent. And then um, any of the university or extension websites, if you do find blogs, there's some, there are some good blogs out there that usually will reference USDA or a university and, and um, those are fine. But if there's something that you're like, oh, that doesn't sound right, it probably isn't. So look for, <laughs> look for a different resource. Um, the Ball Blue Book, that was mentioned, but there's many, many versions of that. The other thing is that um, you also want to look at the date of those resources and publications because you want to choose something that's printed, um, printed from 1994 or later or newer. And because earlier directions, they don't have the current methods and processes, uh, we were seeing more outbreaks in the 19, um, 1970s. So research was redone on canning recipes and so the processing times were updated and released in 1994. So those old family, family recipes may be outdated and under-processed. And again, some folks mentioned there was a, you know, they like blogs, websites, um, there's a lot of videos, a lot of information on the, on the internet. Just um, again, make sure that they research tested recipes. And then our University of Minnesota Extension, we have a preserving, preparing and preserving page. So check that out. We've got a lot of in information there. Um, we have a YouTube channel. This is where these uh, webinars will get posted, but um, we have a preserving uh, playlist uh, and that's where um, these will get posted and we have other 
other uh, videos as well on food safety. And then uh, if you're on Twitter, you can follow us. I, most of my posts are on food preservation. So you find that great resource, <laughs> don't change it. A little bit of this and a little bit of that can really, um, adding things can really change the acidity level um, and the processing time may be not enough to um, destroy what you add, destroy any pathogens that you might add it by adding extra ingredients. Uh, the National Center for Home Food Preservation, again, the, the folks that do all the canning research did a survey um, with consumers and they found 55 of respondents, 55% of respondents use their canning instructions as is, excellent. But, uh, and then while 31% adapted the instructions for their personal use. Um, Adapting recipes is risky and can ultimately affect the processing times and even the method of canning. So please never alter recipes or add extra ingredients. Again, you can um, impact the acidity of your food and the potential for that clostridium botulinum to thrive. Just remember that canning is not cooking. Um, in order to reduce foodborne illness uh, risk associated with home canning, um, you just need to follow recipes as they are. And then I invite you now, I'm going to answer a couple of questions that came through as um, folks registered, you, that you had a chance to ask some questions. So I'll answer some of those. And then if you have more questions, um, Lisa will check those in the chat and we'll go through those too. <clears throat> so someone wanted to know uh, what, you, what can't you can? And, um, or yeah, what can't you can, what does not do well with canning? And there's some foods that won't have canning recipes like pickled eggs and pickled fish because um, during the canning heat processing, they'll get cooked and then they'll be mushy and not, be, not that crispness that you um, enjoy when you eat those products. Um, and then if you can't find a candy recipe, a re reputable one, there's um, a reason for that. And um, one is it was two reasons for that. First reason is that uh, it was found that it's not safe to do it. For example, uh, you will not find a candy recipe for parade pumpkin um, because it's too dense and the heat cannot penetrate through the product to kill that clostridium botulinum spore. Uh, in the canning process, even in the pressure canning process. So, but you will find a recipe for a cubed pumpkin. So again, um, follow what exactly, how you prepare the product is important as well too. And then two, the second reason if you can't find a recipe, USD research, which we have to um, abide by and teach, has not um, been done yet on that product. And then the other question that came up was canning for beginners, any good tricks to the trade? I know we do have many um, new people to canning. I wanna give it a try, learn about it. So I welcome and I applaud you because you, you'll love it once you get the hang of it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, canning for beginners, let's see. I would say that if you can uh, watch someone or help someone do it, that really um, helps relieve some of the anxiety. There are many good videos out there, uh, but I would suggest that you search for a university or extension, you know, just put in canning um, university and something will pop up. There's some really good videos so you can watch. There's, um, university of Alaska has some really good how to showing you how to do it. Um, I can't remember the other university, but I, that's what I would recommend. And Lisa, are there other questions that have come up? There are. There's some really good questions here in the chat. Um, first question, can you overboil if you're canning in water? So overboil, that's, um, you, um, we'll talk about the boiling water, but um, you want to, as soon as it starts boiling again, set your timer and then you can turn it down. It doesn't have to be that rolling boil. So, um, yeah, usually not. Um, it's usually not a problem. 
Okay, another question. How often is it necessary to have uh, my pressure gauge checked? Hey, can you hang on to that one? Um, because we I have a slide on that. <laughs> and then, uh, let's see. Can you reuse your lids? Awesome. Um, so reuse, okay. So the metal lids, which are most traditional, uh, most commonly used in home canning, are designed for one-time use. Uh, they're not recommended for reuse. I know some people have with mixed results. Um, what will happen is that sealing compound around the um, inner lid will weaken um, with multiple use. And you're not gonna get that nice tight vacuum seal that you need to prevent spoilage. Um, that lid will pop off probably during spoilage at some time. So it's um, really, you know, worth the investment. You're doing all that time and labor, you know, to buy new lids. And then kind of related to that, um, is it okay to reuse the rings? Sure, those screw bands. Um, can be reused as long as they're not um, bent or dented or rusted. And then someone is looking for resources for recipes for cucumbers and tomatoes. Excellent. Um, I have a slide coming up from um, the National Center for Home Food Preservation that I, uh, that's really my go-to website. Um, and I'll show you how to um, access that when we get to that. But national, and you can just search for National Center for Home Food Preservation. You'll get on their page and they have a how to um, canning, freezing. But if you click on, click on canning, then all the products will come up and you'll get tomatoes and pickles and yes. That's it so far. Okay, thank you. Thanks for those great questions. Thanks Lisa for helping me out. Now we're going to jump into canning equipment and methods, and we're going to take a look at uh, what's in and what, what's out. Canning's really making a comeback. A lot of people are doing it, and the canning equipment companies are responding um, and marketing um, equipment. So we'll take a look at some things that are good and some things aren't, aren't, and we'll look at both equipment and some methods. So I'm doing this what's in, what's out. So what's in is water bath canners for acidic food. And some of the stuff I repeat for emphasis. <laughs> You're like, well, she already said that, but that's because <laughs> I'm uh, repeating it for a reason. <laughs> but a water bath canner uh, can be used for those high acidic foods like peaches, um, our foods that we add acid to, like um, we'll add um, to salsa or to pickles, vinegar to pickles to change that um, low acid cucumber into an acid food. Uh, and then our temperature will be at a 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you don't really need to run out and get a canner, um, you can use a stock pot as long as it's tall enough uh, to hold your jars. And then there's enough room to add um, water. So it's uh, one to two inches above the jar. And then you got a little um, room in case, you know, for that boiling water so it doesn't boil over. So um, uh, or you can use a traditional canner. You're also going to need some kind of rack um, to sit in the bottom of that canner because you don't want to put your jars directly on the bottom of the canner or they will, they will break. Uh, the other thing that I'll just mention quickly is that the bottom of your canner, um, if you're using an electric stove, should be flat if, um, because it needs to have direct heat onto that coil or that flat top. And we're gonna talk about flat tops in a minute. Um, but if you're using a gas burner, the bottom can be rigid or flat, it doesn't matter. And then a, um, atmospheric steam canners are for acidic foods. Um, they've been out for a long time. The picture's shown here, it looks really like kind of an upside down canner. Um, but what, what you do is you just put some water in the bottom of that and then um, you put the dome on and um, it, it um, heats by steam. And that's for acidic foods. Uh, we didn't have the research on it until 2015. University of Wisconsin did the research and they did find that they're safe 
um, options for high acid foods like peaches and acidified foods like salsa. But there's a, a few caveats, so make sure that you um, follow the directions exactly. Um, you should be using the USDA boiling water bath processing times of 45 minutes or less. If um, your processing time is longer than that, like some tomato products will have a 90 minute processing time, um, you will dry out your canner and that's gonna result in under processing um, your food and an unsafe product. The other thing with these canners is that steam canners that you have to preheat your jars um, before filling and then vent the canner um, so it has a full column of steam before you start your processing time. But if you're interested in that, um, some people find them easier to move around and um, like them. So um, you can search for guidelines for using an atmospheric steam canner by the University of Wisconsin. What's in uh, electrical canning systems are out there. Um, I've seen some new ones come about by um, the Ball Company. They have an electric jam and jelly maker, and I believe they have a pickle maker too, if anyone's tried that. Uh, try to need those, let us know in the chat. Um, but again, the National Center for Home Food Preservation recommends these only for acidic foods. Um, peaches are then um, acidified foods like, like um, pickles, jams and jellies work well on it at, at two. What's in our weighted gauge or dial gauge pressure canners. Um, jarred foods requiring the pressure canning process, again, include meat, seafood, poultry, soups, vegetables, and any food with an acidity level uh, greater than 4.6 does require um, pressure canning. So we can get those temperatures up to 240 to 250 degrees, which is only created by that um, pressurized steam. Uh, there's two types of pressure canners out there. There's the, get my mouse over here, the weighted. Um, gauge and then there's also here is the dial gauge uh, and this isn't actually I don't think I'll, yeah okay it is it's got the rings <laughs> I was like that doesn't look like mine um, anyway the uh, there's two types and they operate differently all pressure canners are will operate differently so please please follow the direction of your um, in your manual that comes with your um, pressure canner exactly because they all work differently but just in generally um, both canners will have um, lids that lock in place to prevent the steam from escaping and uh, lids, and lids um, will have vents and um, pressure is me measured e either by the weight, by a weighted gauge or a dial gauge. A weighted gauge has, um, it can, um, you'll have a dial that turns or um, you put weights on it at 5, 10 and 15 pounds. Uh, it'll either jiggle or rock um, when it's maintaining that correct pressure according to your recipe. And then a dial gauge um, works by um, adjusting in one pound increments. Uh, and pressure canners are safer today. They're a much lighter weight. Um, they have a safety gauge valve, so um, they will not blow up things um, to the ceiling like <laughs> I've seen when I was growing up. I, there was a question about dial gauge testing, so thanks for your patience um, for my answer on this one. But um, the dial gauge, because they have uh, movable parts, they should be tested yearly to make sure that they're working properly and they can be um, calibrated. Uh, work, um, weighted gauges do not need to be tested because they don't function, oh, sorry, so, because they don't um, have movable parts. And there's a, a couple of things that you can do to get those tested. Uh, we do have, I think, about 15 extension county offices in Minnesota that do do pressure gauge um, testing. So you could um, call and check with them. Otherwise, you can chat, um, send in your gauge. And we have information on how to do that on our extension um, website as well, too. You can search for testing dial pressure gauge and go through the instructions on how to send that in. But um, Presto will, will do that for you free of charge. And then what's in question mark? Question mark is food, glass or ceramic, um, portable flat stove tops. 
Maybe. Um, it depends. They've come a long ways away too. Um, some of the manufacturers um, have designed them so they can, you, know, you can safely use your canner on, but check with your manufacturer about that um, because they might have um, specific weight restrictions or also how big the canner can be um, around in diameter to be on that that burner. So um, just make sure that you're checking with them. If you don't have your uh, manufacturing guide anymore, you can always call their toll free customer service um, number. But the other concern with um, some of those um, smooth cooktop stoves is that they'll have an automatic cutoff um, on their burners when the heat gets excessive. And that if that option is built in, the burner under the um, canner will shut off during the process time. And then that product may be under processed and could be a risk for botulism. So check that out as well. Um, and then damage to the glass top surface can happen from um, excessive heat and weight. Um, I actually had mine um, crack. So I switched it. I got to get a gas stove instead. <laughs> um, and then let's see what else do I want to say. Um, on all electric ranges, I think I mentioned this earlier that um, the canner bottom needs to be flat so we have that direct heat. And then for all ranges, uh, um, gas or electric, you want to make sure that the burning element on which it's heated um, matches the size of your canner. So the, um, your canner um, shouldn't be um, bigger, any bigger than four inches. So, and it shouldn't extend more than two inches over the side of the, that unit. Um, some of these glass top um, have, um, have um, more restrictions, like they, they don't want it more than an inch over. So just again, check with your manufacturer about that um, size requirement. And what's in, um, there are some induction compatible pressure canners available for induction gas, electric and smooth top ranges. Um, this one happens to be by Presto. Uh, and what you can do with um, pressure canners, um, all pressure canners can um, function as a boiling water canner. Um, you wouldn't put the lid, um, you wouldn't lock the lid in place, but you could, you know, use it for boiling water purposes. Um, what's in canning jars and lid systems uh, to can food, you'll need clean canning jars and, and a canning lid system. We'll talk about a couple of systems available. Um, the <clears throat> one that's used most of the time are these metal um, two-piece lids and one-time use lids and then the ring bands can be um, used over and over. Uh, you can also use um, reused jars if they're that mason type um, jar that's um, tempered and designed for extreme temperatures for home canning. Most um, home canning jars, you can also, um, they also serve a dual purpose. Um, you can use them in the freezer as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention about jars is that um, your recipe will tell you what size of jar to use. Um, pints versus quarts will usually have different processing times because of the volume. So if your recipe calls for pint jars and does not give directions for quart jars, um, don't use them. Uh, my husband and I were canning dilly beans a few years ago and it only called for pint jars. And he's like, hey, why can't we, let's, let's use quart jars. And I said, no, nope, nope, we can't do that because we only have directions on um, processing time um, tested for um, pint jars. So they're not interchangeable. You can always use, let's say you had a, you know, doing tomatoes quart jar and you had enough to do a pint, you can put it in that pint and process it in the same can with your quart jars of tomatoes, but you would process it at a pint jar would get processed at the processing time of the quart jar. Um, reusing commercial jars like uh, mayonnaise or salad dressing jars, it's not recommended. 
Um, these jars will actually have a narrow, narrow or sealing surface and may not seal properly. That's usually the problem with that. Um, they'll break if you do use them um, in a pressure canner. So never use them in a pressure canner. Um, and then the, just wanted to mention, talk a little bit about how they come. Um, they come in a wide mouth or a standard or regular mouth. Um, and that's just um, the opening on the top. That's what that means. And the opening on a regular or standard mouth is about two um, and three eighths inches, in inches. And those work well for jams, jellies, uh, sauces, things that you're gonna pour, juices. Uh, the wide mouth um, jars will have an opening of three inches and they work well for packing raw foods uh, like cucumbers, um, like, like billy beans. That worked really well. And then the two piece lids, the canning lids. Um, we suggest that uh, the unused lids have a manufactured date of five years. So when I buy my new lids, I always take a Sharpie and write the year that I bought it and use that first, or first in first out method. So the next year I'm using, you know, lid, lid, the oldest lids first. And then um, what's in BPA free metal lids and reusable plastic lids. Um, again, anything by the ball company, they switched over and all of their lids are BPA free. You can check with other manufacturers on other brands. There's other canning lid systems available and just follow the manufacturers directions on how to use that. Um, the, Nash, the ones you're seeing here are called the Tatler lid and they're plastic reusable. The rings are reusable as well. Um, and they go on the jar and then you, you do use a typical screw band, I believe. If anybody has experience, I don't have experience with the Tatler lids. Um, but the National Center for Home Food Preservation, they did a study. They compared the Tatler reusable um, plastic lids to the um, regular canning lids, um, standard canning lids. And they, want, they were looking to see if um, the seals failed over time in storage. And what they found of the, 900, the 192 jars they tested, two vacuum seals failed after one month and two um, more seals failed at three months of storage with the Tatler lids. Uh, there were no seal failures with the metal lids. Uh, safety of the canning process does not depend on the choice of the lid used. What's in, um, this is another, <laughs> I've seen these um, popping up all over um, in stores, the half gallon jars, and I'm like, hmm, I don't know a lot of people that can apple juice and grape juice, and look, because those are the only two products that can be safely canned in, in a half gallon jar, um, according to USDA guidelines and recipes. So um, no other food or juices can be safely canned in half gallon jars. They do, however, uh, make great um, jars for uh, dried beans or popcorn. So to can, you'll need a stock pot canner or pressure canner that works um, with your stove top, as we mentioned earlier, uh, and for that food that you're canning. There is a canning toolkit that's pretty inexpensive, around $20. I think it's worth the investment. Um, it comes with these convenient canning tools a jar lifter, which will help you move that filled jar into and out, out of the canner. Uh, this is called a jar uh, funnel. And um, this is really a helpful um, tool. Um, jar filler um, is a helpful funnel to um, use when you're filling your jars so there's not spillage. Here's a tool here called a bubble freer. Um, and I'll show you one that I use that actually on the other side has a headspace measuring tool. Uh, you'll also need to use um, some, uh, you have a timer available and then other standard kitchen tools to prepare your food for canning. What's out is uh, gas burners um, with a BTU over 12,000 and uh, for pressure canners. So BTUs is short for British thermal units and one BTU will equal the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. 
Uh, the BTU capacity is listed on your owner's manual um, for stoves and ranges. So if you don't know your BTUs, uh, the average um, home stove for a gas burner will have uh, 17,000 BTUs per burner. Um, some burners are lower and some, some are higher. So there's a, um, you can get some burners um, that are monster burners on a range and they will go up to that 12,000 um, BTU. And then also your gas burners too. So if you're doing any of those um, with like a turkey fryer burner, um, check, the, check the BTUs on that. Um, the reason is that um, those LP gas burners that uh, are ranges over 12,000, but what's gonna happen is that super high heat's gonna damage your pressure canner, um, especially the newer and thinner um, versions that are out there today, and it's gonna warp and it's not gonna be functional anymore. So that's, that's kind of critical. Um, it's gonna warp and, and not work anymore. So that's the reason for that. And the other thing that will happen is that it can, um, that extreme high heat can dry out your canner quickly and um, in, result in improperly processing of your food. If you're wondering the heating power of electric stoves, uh, they are tend to be measured in watts instead of BTUs, the largest burner on the highest setting um, of an electric stove is typically around 2,500 watts, which equates to about 8,500 BTU. So it's under that um, 12,000. Uh, what's out are pressure cookers. Uh, USDA does not have recommended processes for canning and small pressure cookers. Uh, the recommend, recommendation um, by USDA is that to process low acid foods, and a, you need a pressure canner that holds at least four quart jars. So pressure canner that holds at least four quart jars that are standing upright on the rack with the lid in place. A lot of our uh, electric pressure canners and uh, multi-cookers will have a, a pressure canner setting on it. Um, some infomercials advertise that you, you, these units are safe using the National Center for Home Food Preservation instructions, but this is not true uh, and has prompted a consumer advisory against the using electric pressure canners and multi-cooker appliances for home canning. By using the oven, uh, microwave, or dishwasher to home can food is unsafe. These methods have been deemed unsafe for years. Uh, however, the internet um, sites uh, are promoting them as simple canning methods today. Uh, the heat producing, um, the heat produced by these units is not adequate to destroy those spoilage and disease causing microorganisms. So again, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> Uh, what's out is open kettle or version canning methods, and these will be found in your old cookbooks books and canning books and probably grandma um, as well. But um, these methods aren't really canning because you're not putting hot food into jars and sealing with the lid and then, um, you know, there's no um, additional heat processing that goes on. The inversion method instructs you to um, put the hot food in the jar, the lid on, and then um, invert it, uh, turn it upside down um, for a period of time. Uh, the National Center for Home Food Preservation study found 44% of home canners open kettle fruit and tomatoes and 35 open kettle vegetables, which is really, really dangerous because that's a low acid food, right? And 20% 20 20 again, we're canning um, open kettling um, meat or fish and again, low acid food. So very risky for botulism. Again, safe food preservation resources will instruct you to heat process your food product either in a boiling water canner or in a pressure canner to destroy those disease and spoiled microorganisms. Uh, there are some research, and someone asked this question when they registered um, about uh, the, this um, open kettle hot fill um, method. And there also is a cold filled method too that commercial um, canners use and some food entrepreneurs, um, but 
you know, there's strict monitoring, acidity levels, and time and temperature that goes into that. It's very controlled, and it's really not conducive for home use. So if you would like to share in the chat, what is your favorite canning equipment or tool and why? Do you have time for a few questions also? I do, go ahead, Lisa. Okay, um, someone was wondering what the shelf life of canned products is. Excellent, sure, well, we can um, answer that now. Um, it, you, typically we say try to uh, use up what you, you know, try to can what you can use up in a year. Uh, uh, the ball has uh, new lids out there called SureTight and they're guar they guarantee nutrition and quality for 18 months. So um, it's up to you. I mean, indefinitely, if the seal is still, uh, you know, tight when you open it, um, but um, the quality is going to be poor the longer you keep it. And then I've also got some responses for you about your question about favorite canning equipment tool. Um, someone said the water bath canner, just for the ease of use. Um, Larissa said the can lifter, how else do you get them out? Um, another person said the jar lifter. I also use a padded dish dryer for hot jars when they come out of the canner. Awesome. And then Sally said her uh, canning funnel in Lidl. Awesome, good, great, great. Yeah, um, good question about the um, jar lifter. I was just thinking that, how would you get those out? Um, I know there's some silicone long, you know, um, gloves that might work, but yeah, they could slip. So uh, yeah, I think that's the best tool as well for in, getting those jars in and out. Thanks everyone. Anything else, Lisa? Okay, we'll move on. So finally, let's get ready to can. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are probably gonna go over here. So feel free to jump off if you need to, if you can stay on, uh, great. Um, if, and again, this is being recorded so that we will um, post it later. We are recording that, right, Lisa? <laughs> I forgot to turn it back on. <laughs> Correct, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, so food safety. Yes, of course. When, when processing, think about you're in a home canning factory, okay? What's gonna, what goes on in a, a commercial processing, you know, bring that um, into, your, into your house so that you're producing a safe product. Again, um, home canning recipes and methods are tested for those best ingredients. So you always wanna use your fresh produce at its peak ripeness and quality. Uh, using, um, produce that's free of uh, disease, bruises, um, cracks, insect damage is important because diseased or bruised products um, may harbor pathogens and the process time may not be sufficient to kill extra organisms contained in damaged or um, diseased produce. So use those, you know, um, cook those up, freeze them, instead of using them for canning if they do have some damage. Don't use them for canning because the acidity level can be affected. Um, just looking at my notes. Let's see, there's a lot to this. Food safety includes cleaning your produce well before use, um, making sure that you're rinsing all produce under running tap water before you're preparing it to process. Uh, and you wanna make sure that you're, if it's got a firm, skin on it. Um, I take my produce brush or you can use your hands, clean hands or a soft um, um, cloth to really um, rub and get in there. Um, the most common reason for sour flat spoilage in tomatoes, and I know a lot of you wanted to can tomatoes, is because they weren't cleaned well before canning. So making sure you're taking the time and effort to clean those products really well. And then a clean and sanitary kitchen is critical to prevent the introduction of harmful pathogens into your product and washing your hands well before beginning and often during the process, making sure if you're using that sink to wash your produce that that's clean and sanitized as well. 
And then finally, avoid preserving when you're sick, especially with symptoms of foodborne illness like diarrhea and or vomiting, um, because those are always a foodborne disease risk to the food and others. If you wanna use clean, clean equipment, be sure to wash stored canners. I pulled mine out from the basement um, this weekend. It's all full of dust. And I'm like, oh, I gotta wash this thing? Yes, you do. <laughs> and um, jars, lids, and screw bands, and hot soapy water uh, before using. Make sure you're rinsing well to get it um, off any of that soap residue. And then just the good news about the lids, the canning lids, it's no longer um, necessary to preheat those canning um, metal lids. So if you've been canning for a long time, you always have to preheat them in a hot water, um, but you just wash those rinsels and can keep them at room temperature before um, and you need them. It is important though to preheat jars. So um, what you're gonna do is submerge clean, empty canning jars into enough um, water to cover them. So a large stock pot or boiling water canner works. Um, if you will be filling the jars with a raw pack, you're going to preheat food or preheat um, your water and jars to 140 degrees. If you're filling the jars with hot food, you're going to heat the jars and water to 180 degrees. And you can monitor that. Sorry, I'm just jumping around today. And you can monitor that by um, with a thermometer to verify the temperature of the water. But this preheating of jars is important um, step. As the processing times are calculated by uh, using jar, um, hot jars and the method of fill. So there's two methods to fill or what we call pack the jars or this is called style of pack. Um, hot or raw pack are the two options. So um, we'll start with hot, hot pack. So hot packing means that you heat the food to boiling and then you pack the hot food and its liquid into the jars. Uh, hot pack is best um, for most foods to allow that air that's in natural, natural air that's in the produce to be driven out of the fruit or vegetable um, during the cooking, cooking process. You'll be able to pack more food into the jar and you'll have less floating of product after you can it. Uh, in addition, that preheating uh, will help to retain your color of the, that fruit or vegetable and the flavor of the product. Um, in a raw pack though, some, um, some recipes like your pickle, pickles will be raw pack for quality. Um, you're gonna put those in the jar raw and then you um, will put um, usually brine or boiling hot water um, over that. Sometimes like if you're doing fruit, raw pack fruit, you'll do a, a syrup or water um, to cover the, the fruit. And then um, when you're raw packing, you want to make sure that you're packing it firmly, but be careful not to crush. Um, otherwise, you'll get floating floaters in your jar after you process those. Processing times may be longer for cold pack, so make sure you're watching for that. Uh, and then use um, whatever method is indicated in your recipe. Sometimes you'll have an option for hot or raw um, and you'll have a choice. But make sure that you're using um, the style of pack that the recipe tells you to. And I just wanna to mention tomatoes quickly. A lot of you are doing tomatoes. Uh, because of the variation of the acidity levels with tomatoes, USDA, USDA uh, recommends that um, the, our methods will have um, added acid, that you add acid to all water bath or pressure canned tomato products. You're gonna add acid to each jar prior to adding the tomatoes in the form of citric acid, lemon juice, or vinegar. Uh, powdered citric acid, um, that's my go-to now. I've switched to that. Um, it's widely available um, in canning, wherever you get your canning supplies. And uh, you can use uh, also find it citric acid powder in um, some food stores. Just make sure it's food grade. Um, and then if you're using lemon juice, it has to be commercially bottled uh, lemon juice. Um, you can also use bottled lime juice if you prefer that flavor. As uh, but fresh lemons or fresh limes will vary in acidity, so you have to use that bottled commercial 
um, lemon or lime juice. Uh, more vinegar is required uh, than um, bottled lemon juice. If your family member notices flavor changes with this added acid, you can always offset it by adding a small amount of sugar and one um, teaspoon per quart does the trick to offset that acidic flavor. And then you're gonna fill your jars with product uh, to the correct headspace. And uh, what um, you should do though, is when you're ready to fill your jars, you just remove one jar at a time from your canner, leave the other ones um, in the canner heating um, as the processing time again is calculated using hot jars and that method of fill. So take one can, one jar out, um, you're gonna empty the, drain the water back into the canner. Um, I, I usually will flip, tip it and put it on a towel so I get all the water out and then I'm ready to fill my jar. And for headspace, which is actually that empty space between the top of the food here and the top of the jar uh, ring here. And that for juice and jam, it's one quarter inch. And so that's, you can go all the way right here. I mean, that's a quarter inch. So she's doing tomatoes, which is gonna have a half inch um, and vegetables um, and meat, one inch, poultry, one and a quarter inch. Again, your recipe will indicate how much um, headspace um, you should leave. The headspace is um, important to, uh, for proper vacuum sealing. Um, too little headspace will um, force the food under the lid and liquids and solids and seeds can um, get caught under there under that sealing um, compound and prevent uh, the jar from sealing. Uh, too much headspace, the processing time may be, not be long enough to drive all that air out of uh, the, the can, uh, jar and then it will cause that food to discolor and it can re result in a lower and weak feel. So headspace is important. Uh, another thing is after you fill the food and liquid to the proper headspace, you want to um, release any air uh, bubbles that were might have gotten trapped as you were pouring or putting your product into the jar. So what you want to do is take a plastic utensil or um, your kit, if you have a canning toolkit, will come with a bubble freer and you're going to go along the um, sides around the jar and the inside and lift that product up a little bit to, re, um, to get any air bubbles out. And you'll see them come out. They, there is stuff that um, gets in there. It gets trapped as you pour things in. Uh, you don't want to use a metal um, utensil like a metal knife because you can scratch the glass and it can get, you can weaken it and it can break during processing. And then you can adjust uh, your, you'll probably need to adjust the headspace um, after you remove those air bubbles. And what that means is that you would add more product or liquid to the jar. Um, and this bubble freer that's shown here actually acts as a, um, on the one end it's the bubble freer, on the other end it's a measuring tool for headspace. So that's kind of neat. And then you're going to um, take, after you adjusted the head, space, you're ready to get your lids on um, and then you're going to wipe the rim of the jar and also the screw bands. So I get nice wet and I wipe all around here and, and, and the top of the rim um, to get out any spillage or any off any spillage or anything residue, food residue that might have spilled on there because um, that could affect the seal. So making sure you're doing that is really important. And then you're ready to apply your screw band if that's the um, lid system that you're using. And so for, um, you put the screw band on, uh, first you center the lid, put that on, and then um, your screw band you'll um, tighten until you feel resistance, until it stops turning. Don't over tighten it um, as this can interfere with um, the air being driven out and um, escape from the jar and then you're, you're, you won't get that tight uh, or proper seal. So boiling water steps, we're ready to move on to that. Um, and I think it's always a good idea to, you know, kind of 
in my mind when I'm starting to can is like, you know, what are those top steps that um, you need to do? So let's take a look at that. Um, you're going to, uh, you know, you preheated your jars and you preheated your water and you filled your jars. Now you're ready to load your canner um, into the rack. So it, your jars are going to go into the rack. Uh, that jar lifter is that handy tool. Um, when you're lifting your jars in and taking them out of the canner after processing time, it should be an up, um, upward motion. Don't tilt the jars again because uh, it can spill into the ceiling area and not, um, the lid won't seal properly. So keep, make sure that you're keeping them upright when you're tra transferring to the count, like in and out of the canner. And then for boiling water canner, um, if you need to add um, more hot water, so boiling, I usually have a pot of boiling water on the stove because you want to cover the jars and to be covered at least with one to two inches of water above the jar. So you have that, they're, they're in a water bath. That's why it's called that. Um, make sure you allow more, like two inches um, above if your processing time is longer than 30 minutes because, um, you know, the water will evaporate during those longer processing times. And then you're going to turn your, you're going to put the cover on, turn your heat on high. And then um, each canning recipe will give you that specific amount of time that you need to water bath or pressure can your product. And again, these are research um, tested to destroy those microorganisms. And again, it's affected by how you pack it and the, how thick the food is, how dense it is the acidity level of the food, the size of, of the jar, those are all um, built into how long you process your food. Um, it ranges from um, you know, five minutes to 90 minutes with some, um, some products. So then you'll um, start your timer for your processing time when uh, the water returns to a rapid boil and um, you, Maintain that complete boil so you can um, turn it down. It doesn't have to be a rapid rolling boil, but it has to be a nice steady boil. And um, if the boiling stops anytime during your canning time, then you need to actually start all over with your canning time. So you, you know, turn it back to high, get that boiling, and then we start your canning process. So um, Let's make sure, that's why I just really monitor, make sure I have a nice, nice steady boil throughout. And then when your process is complete, you're going to, the timer goes off, you're done. You're going to take the cover, the um, lid off, and you're going to uncover it, and then you're going to let it sit there for five minutes, okay? And the reason for that is um, this is a recommendation actually by um, the company that makes the two piece lids um, so that you don't have boil over um, of, uh, you know, because it's still boiling in there and it can break that seal. So just let it kind of settle down and then you'll remove your, uh, then you'll unload the canner and you're going to use your jar lifter, uh, removing one jar at a time, keep them in an upright um, position and then move them to a towel or a pad. Someone said they had a padded surface or a cooling rack. Um, try to space them apart about an inch so they have air to circulate. Um, don't cover it up with a towel. Um, they need to sit there and cool on their own. Um, don't worry about the screw band may have come loosened during the, um, the process. Don't worry about that. Just leave, leave it be for 12 to um, 24 hours. Now um, we'll cover pressure canning steps, how to properly use, um, pressure can, um, and they are, they are really different processes. So we'll take a peek at that. Now, this is the website I've been promoting, uh, the National Center for Home Food Preservation. And um, they have, like right here, under, um, so you get my mouse over here. Um, how do I can freeze dry? here from at Pickle Jam Jelly store. But if you click on canning, um, you're going to get um, information, you get a general information um, and look for the um, instructions for using a pressure canner. 
because it go, reviews all these steps. And then there's also one on boiling water as well too. If you can find it in the canning section, you can go to publications and University of Georgia. I know it's there as well too. So the big difference in when you're using a pressure canner, remember in boiling water, um, we're filling the canner up, right? And we're covering the jars by one to two inches. That's not the case in with a pressure canner. We're only heating two to three inches of water in the canner. Um, and we're gonna preheat that water to 140 for raw pack and 180 for hot pack. So, um, so you really do, again, you wanna heat your jars to those same levels. So you're really going to need another, um, like a stock pot or a you know, water bath canner to preheat your jars in, in you know, full water because um, we're only putting in two to three inches in our, in our um, pressure canner. And then when we're ready to load the canner with filled jars, um, we're gonna put that just, um, usually it just comes with a flat rack. We put it on, on the rack inside the canner using our jar list lifter. And then whenever you're loading a canner, whether it's um, a water bath or a pressure canner, um, leave you know, a little space between each jar so that again the water can um, our steam in this case can circulate and and um, process it correctly and then once the um, canner is loaded then you're uh, ready to put on the lid and it's going to flat um, fasten into place and click into place um, and lock into place and you want to make sure that it's it's even and on there tightly. Um, you can use layers. Um, you can stack jars um, as long as there's something, a rack or something in between. You can do that for water bath can canners as well. And then you're going to, when you put your lid on, uh, you're going to leave off the, the weight or the, um, um, the little pet cock it's called, um, you're gonna leave that open because then you're going to, so right here, you're gonna leave that open and you're gonna allow steam to exhaust. So you're gonna turn your burner on high until you'll see steam. Here, you'll see that steam flowing. That steam needs to flow, set a timer for 10 minutes. So once you see that steam, um, set a timer for 10 minutes, this is called exhausting or venting. And uh, this is a critical step as it drives air from the canner so it will pressurize. So that's a critical step. Um, and then after that 10 minutes, you can um, put your weight on or close the um, petcock if you're using a dial gauge. And then you're gonna let the pressure rise. Uh, that's indicated in your recipe. So um, in Minnesota, our dial gauge um, will usually be set at, 11 pounds and our weighted gauge is at 15 pounds. And then um, your recipe will indicate how long you have to keep it at that pressure. And then you want to maintain, try to maintain that at a steady level. Um, and so you need to watch this closely um, because you don't want to um, pressures to fluctuate because that can cause um, jars to lose their liquid and then it will damage the seals and they can be under process and unsafe. So it's, um, it, it's a little bit of an art to get you know, it right. But once you figure out your stove and, and how your canner works, um, you'll get a system down. And then again, just like with boiling water, if you lose that pressure, it drops below the level for that safe processing, um, then you need to start all over again. And then when your time is up uh, and you know, your timer went off, then you're gonna, going to um, turn off the stove. So turn off the heat. And then you have to let your um, pressure, your canner depressurize on its own. So uh, <clears throat> what you're gonna do is just uh, you know, let it be. And this one um, here will drop to zero. And um, for weighted gauge, follow your manufacturer directions. You know, this can take up to an hour. So it's, it, it's something that does take some time. Um, and then um, you wanna make sure you're not force cooling. Some people like to place the ganner in the cold water. Uh, that force cooling will cause the jars to lose liquid and again, may damage their seals. So, you know, just be patient. <laughs> and it'll also lead to under processing and unsafe 
a safe product. Uh, when the pressure has reached zero, then you can remove that weight um, or open the pet cock. Um, again, for <clears throat> dial gauges, follow your manufacturing instructions for how to depressurize your cannon. Then um, after you open that vent, uh, you got to let it steam for 10 minutes. So get, it, it's really hot. So you want to get that um, steam out for 10 minutes. So that's another 10 minutes. And then you're going to unload your canner after those 10 minutes. Um, be careful. Again, it's going to be hot. So open the lid away from you. Uh, and then um, you're going to use a jar lifter um, and remove those jars from the, from the canner. When you store, um, we'll talk a little bit about um, how to store and use products. We're, we're getting to the end, so thanks for hanging in there, everyone. Um, the first thing after you've let them cool for that 12 to 24 hours, you're going to check the seal. Um, and what you're going to do is, uh, if you're using this type of system, the um, two-piece metal lid system, you're going to press down in the metal, and it should be um, concaved. Um, and then if you press down, you should not hear a clicking sound. If you hear a clicking sound, it didn't seal. And we'll talk about what, you, what your options are for not, jars that didn't seal. Um, and then I always remove the screw band. And, and as I'm showing in this picture, what I'm doing here is actually I'm pulling up on the lid, making sure it's tight. And if it comes off, and that's something it didn't, it didn't seal right, but it shouldn't, shouldn't budge at all. And if your jars didn't seal, you have uh, three options. And one is that you can reprocess um, using a clean jar, a new lid, uh, within 24 hours of processing. And option two is you can refrigerate um, that product. Uh, and then option three is you can store, transfer it, um, or store it in a freezer in the freezer, probably in that jar, um, if it's freezer safe. And then, but you will need to readjust your headspace to one and a half inches. And then this is also often a, a forgotten step, but um, before you put it in your um, pantry, you want to make sure that you're um, washing the jar down. Um, take a, a soapy wet um, cloth, clean cloth, and um, wipe it down really well. And the reason for that is you want to remove any um, residue that um, is on that jar and um, pay attention to the um, screw band threads. Um, wipe that down well because it, anything, any residue left on that can mold during storage. And then you want to date and store uh, your product. Uh, the screw bands, I never, um, I leave those off during storage. Um, you can leave them on, but um, they may rust. Um, but I take mine off and um, you can store them again for 12 to 18 months. Uh, you should store them in a cool, um, dark, dry place. And the temperature is about 50 to 70 degrees is best. Um, don't go over 95 degrees because heat is, you know, can really um, damage the quality and um, destroy nutrients in home cam products. And um, the risk of spoilage really does jump uh, the hotter it gets in there. So, and so don't store um, near, near hot pipes, a range, a furnace, insulate, uninsulated attic or in direct sunlight. Uh, under these conditions, again, the food quality um, will be lost just within a few months, a few weeks or months. And then a light is also very damaging um, to nutrients and um, and color as well too. And you can store again up to um, one year for best quality or if you're using those sure tight uh, lids by um, ball, you can use it, um, you know, they'll store up to 18 months. But again, it's indefinitely. I always, when I put my, um, I have a canning cupboard and I'll do that first in first out. So I move stuff in the back that I can last year. If I still have product, I didn't have much um, and move it, so I'm using that first. Uh, the, somebody asked when they were signing up, um, when, when can you eat the stuff? <laughs> um, so when you can something, usually you're doing it for, to use it late, you know, later on, um, but you could eat it right away. Some um, products, so like your pickle products, 
they need to um, meld their flavors and get that nice, you know, pickly flavor. So usually pickles, it's three to four weeks before they're ready to eat. And then for, um, before you eat your product, make sure that you're checking to make sure that that seal didn't break or become loose during storage. If it did, um, don't use it, um, discard it. And if there's any indication of, of spoilage, um, please don't taste it um, because, um, you know, even, you know, tasting it, um, it, botulism, the food doesn't look bad, taste bad, smell bad. Um, just one, one small taste can, can be enough to, to cause Ill, illness. So, and then when you're discarding um, home canned food that um, you're not sure about, that it's spoiled, um, you know, be careful doing that. And also don't, um, you know, discard it where animals can access it. They can get botulism too. So, and then don't compost um, that as well. And then as an extra precaution, we recommend that you boil uh, pressure canned foods on the stove for 11 minutes. And that 11 minutes is for Minnesota altitudes um, before eating. You know, it, the, the good news, if you made a mistake during processing, um, the extra step of boiling will kill that botulism toxin. The spores are only killed at um, 240 to 250 degrees but we can, um, if we're boiling that product at 11 minutes, if it did get botulism toxin um, in it, we can, we can destroy that. So in summary, uh, credible recipes, right? Credible, credible research tested recipes. The year, um, look for resources 1994 or newer. Um, we're gonna follow those processing times and methods exactly. We're not gonna add any more of this or any more of that. Um, and then we're, yeah, we're going to have fun. We're going to can. And I say, yes, you can can. Uh, thanks for joining me today. If you have a minute to put in, um, in the chat, one thing you learned today and one action item you will take as a result, um, from being on this webinar and Lisa, then I'll turn it over to you to see if we've had any questions come in in the meantime. I do have quite a few questions for you. Some of them you addressed, such as pressure canning in the Instapot, which is a no. Right. Um, someone asked if a change of color um, in your can product after a few months is okay. Like, uh, for instance, chili sauce turning dark. Right, yeah. And again, it'll depend on your temperature. Um, uh, and, and if it's exposed to light, light will damage that color. It could be um, also... Um, we talked about the headspace. So if we have too much headspace in there, um, that can darken product as well too. So those are a couple things to think about. Okay, and then, like I said, some of these you probably already addressed. If high heat kills all bacteria, do you have to sterilize jars first? Yes, yeah, so, um, <clears throat> You know, putting preheating your jars is usually sufficient. Um, the only time that you would sterilize, have to sterilize jars, which means putting in a boiling water for 10, at least 10 minutes, is if your processing time is less than 10 minutes. And most of our processing time in Minnesota is going to be 10 minutes or longer. Um, there are probably are some jam and jelly recipes out there that are less that are less than five minutes, depending on the type or six minutes. I think there's six minutes depending on the size of the jar. So so yes, sterilizing jars is important. If your processing time is less than 10 minutes, if it's not, then the um, boiling water or the um, preheating is, is sufficient. Um, is it safe to partially fill a jar? Uh, well, <laughs> again, it's a headspace, right? So no, um, it's not recommended. Um, some of your meat products will have different um, you know, bigger headspace, but um, no, you should, um, again, your, the quality is not going to be there and you might, it might interfere with the seal. So, no, I would always, if you have an extra little product, I always just take that and refrigerate it. Okay. Um, and then also wanted to know, do you have to remove the screw band after cooling? 
Uh, no, you don't, but I do, and especially, um, you know, to, to do that washing of the jar before I store it to get that residue off. So if you, if you want to, and then I wash the bands too. So if you wanted to wash the bands and you feel more comfortable about, you know, storing them with a, a screw band on, I mean, you could do that, but I would just, I would clean everything first and then, then put it back on because you're going to have less chance of, you know, that, um, if there's residue on that band that could um, mold too. And, and um, bigger chance if it's, there's, it's damp at all that it could rust. And I believe you addressed this as well. Uh, someone was wondering if you can uh, mix pint and quart jars together or if you should just stick with one size jar. Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and mix um, sizes of jars. Uh, you will um, always use the processing time for the biggest jar though. And then there's a company that advertises a pressure canner that doesn't have a gauge or, or, or a weighted top. Is it safe? Yeah, I'd, I'd have to do some research. I don't know anything about that. Maybe someone um, who asked that question could put in the chat what it is and we could, we could check that out. And do canning jars have a lifespan? Can they be too old to you? Great question. Uh, usually I've seen, um, 15 to 20 years, <laughs> but depends on use and storage and things like that. But yeah, so they last a long time, but over time and over use, they can wear down and break, but making sure that you're always checking. And I'm not sure if I mentioned that um, when you're washing the jar, um, look for cracks, crevices, you know, any um, hairline cracks that might be in there. And then always check the rim. Um, if there's any nicks or chips, then um, don't use those because then you'll, your jars won't seal. And are old pressure canners still safe? Uh, someone was gifted a fairly, a family heirloom, all American cast aluminum pressure canner. Just wondering if that'll be safe to use. I, again, depending on um, what condition it's in. And um, a lot of times, I'm, I don't think those have the um, rings on or the um, gaskets look for those. Those are more of the clamp. Um, but I, the, the, usually the problem is, it, is um, check with the manufacturers to see if you can get parts. Um, so I would start, if I'm going to use that, I would just um, do some, wa uh, start with just water and just test it out with uh, fill jars of, of water and, and you know a few of those and then just to test it out first, see how it's working. And do the jars um, and everything else, do they have to be washed in the dishwasher? Uh, no, they don't. You can use the dishwasher, but um, I just I don't have a dishwasher, so um, the dishwasher. <laughs> People that were mentioning the things that they they are their takeaways from your presentation um, about you know boiling non-acidic foods for 11 minutes before serving. They said that was a good tip, uh, not to tweak the recipes. Uh, can you give one more description of testing the lid and if it clicks? Um, sure. Maybe we'll go back to that slide. Um, well, maybe this, and, and, the, and this here, I don't know if you can see it, but it's like um, flat. And if it's, um, I'll have to take a picture of that, <laughs> of one that's not, because it's going to have a raised little bump on it if it's not sealed. And then, um, oops, going back here. Hopefully I'm not making you guys dizzy. Oops. Um, find that slide. And if anyone in the chat wants how they check, but so, um, you know, if you take your forefinger and press in the middle, uh, it shouldn't press down and, and um, make a noise or go up and down. Maybe, maybe they don't all click depending. Um, but um, yeah, so it shouldn't make a sound. Um, and then there should be, it should be indented, you know,
Sorry, I'm not sure how to, how to explain that better. Is there a way to seal dehydrated foods in jars? Uh, yes, there are. Um, you know, there's different uh, like vacuum things that you can get to remove all of the air out of there. I'm not as familiar with that, but we've got a dehydrating session coming up and I'll do some research. So join me for that one. And then someone was wondering if darkened food is safe to eat. Um, again, check your check your um, lid. Make sure it was a, a nice tight seal, um, and that there's no indication of spoilage. Um, darkened food will happen over time. How long it's been in there? Um, I know even some product I can last year is much darker than what I put in there this year. So just that time will, will it'll just naturally be that. And then can you in, omit salt from a recipe? Oh, great question. Yeah, um, salt is usually used for um, quality, not for safety, except if you're fermenting um, product, then, that, and then it is um, required, but um, you can. There are um, on that National Center for Home Food Preservation, they under canning, they have um, some reduced salt um, recipes and also some low sugar recipes as well. So again, follow um, if you want to use reduced salt or reduce um, sugar, um, you know, use a recipe that's been tested for that. That'll be for the best flavor as well. Uh, someone was wondering if we could share the YouTube video for the freezing webinar and I'm wondering maybe what we could do is just email everyone that joined us today the link to the YouTube channel and the additional hands out, handouts and things so that people will have those um, for reference. Yeah, that's excellent. I think we, I don't know, Lisa, if you had a chance, we do have a couple of really good reference um, sheets on canning, uh, one on acid foods and one on um, low acid foods that have the, the jar size, the style of pack, the headspace, and then the processing time um, and pressures. So that's going to be a helpful handout to send as well. Yeah, I'll make sure that everyone gets a copy of, of all of that information. And then it just people were just commenting how much they just uh, got some good information just really enjoyed enjoyed the webinar today. When I was setting this up, I'm like, oh, I should really make them an hour and a half because <laughs> there's always <laughs> so much to say. Um, but please join if you can in some upcoming webinars. Uh, we got pickle clean, free um, tomatoes, drying, preserving fall vegetables, and fermenting coming up. So um, yeah, if you have any suggestions for other topics that um, aren't on the schedule, um, we'll probably end up um, scheduling some more at some point. So uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for hanging in there. Thanks for your great questions and information and sharing with everyone. Um, we always uh, learn from each other. So appreciate your time today.